Thank you all for coming today. I have been informed that it would be wise to ask all of you to silence your cell phones during this flight. <laughs> Dr. Sauer, who is scheduled to speak first, is actually running a few minutes late. So if it's all right with you, we'll be inverting some items on the agenda and moving directly to my own remarks. My name is Giovanni Ruffini. I am a professor of history and classical studies, director of the classical studies program. The reason why the classical studies program is hosting this event may not be immediately obvious, but hopefully will become clear in the next few minutes. It has been just over a year now since Vince Roosevelt died near the end of his 53rd year as a professor in our classical studies program. Now anyone whose career reaches that advanced stage, I think will have many stories told about him. Many of those stories apocryphal, unlikely, some of them even suspicious. And as we gather here today to celebrate the launch of the Fairfield Slavery Project, I think of two of those apocryphal stories in particular that I would like to share with you today. Now, as with so many apocryphal stories, uh, they may have some grain of truth to them and are in any case too good to be thrown out. So here we go. The first story actually goes back several decades, I think long before most of you were here, to a time when Vince still kept an office at the end of the history department hallway on the third floor of Canisius. While he was not a member of the history department, Vince always considered himself an historian. He was justifiably proud of his research and writing as an historian, and perhaps unkindly, was critical of his colleagues who put less emphasis on the research and writing side of their work. Background music. <laughs> According to the first apocryphal story that I've received from the traditions of our elders, in the middle of a fight, because he had a few of those, with our department's former US colonial historian, Vince stormed off in a huff, announcing, and I quote, if none of you are willing to research local colonial history, I'll do it myself." <laughs> Unquote. Now Vince, as always, was true to his word. And the result was a series of articles on colonial Connecticut published in the mid-1990s, including two on slaves and slavery in Connecticut. There the matter sat for quite a while. When I first got to know Vince 10, 11 years ago, his interest in slavery was, was in the rearview mirror, not quite out of sight. He always imagined he would find time to come back to it later at some point. And, and this is how we get to the second apocryphal story about Vince Roosevelt, a much more recent one, in which Vince is reported to have walked into the provost's office and handed Mary Frances Malone a very large paper bag full of cash and said, I want to start a research fund, and gave her all the cash. And this project was born. Olivia and Alec have been living off of that paper bag of cash for a year and a half now. So well done, kids. Um, and, and let me just say how lucky and blessed that Vince was to find them, two such talented, smart, hardworking students who invested so deeply in his work that they would not let it die when he did. That they dedicated a year of their lives to continuing what they had all started together, to see it to fruition here today. May we all be so lucky to have people like them in our lives one day. Olivia and Alec, thank you. Someday I think Vince uh, somewhere is, is smiling down at this right now. Now uh, our, our first speaker has arrived, Dr. Glenn Sauer from the Dean's office. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Giovanni. And thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Glenn Sauer. I'm in the College of Arts and Sciences Dean's Office. And I'm just here to welcome you all. Um, you know, Giovanni has told you uh, many things already about Vin. Um, you know, I didn't know Vincent that well, although I served with him on committees over the years, but I didn't really know him personally. But I did, um, I was, so I, I was a little bit surprised um, 
to see that he was involved in the slavery project. That, that dates back, as I understand, to the 80s. Um, but when I think about Vin and what I do know about him, what always struck me about him was his integrity and the moral authority with which he spoke with at faculty meetings and committee meetings and in general. And he was always very outspoken advocate for faculty rights, for workers' rights, both on campus and off campus. So in retrospect, it's not too surprising that he would also have an interest in workers that had no rights going back to the times of the slavery. And so that perhaps is what led him to initiate this project. And I'm very glad you're here to share in it today. Um, and just once again, welcome. And thank you again to uh, Vin's students who have carried this forward. So thanks. Without any further ado, the students of the Faculty Student Collaborative Research Project, Olivia and Alec. All right, hi everyone, thank you so much for coming. My name is Olivia. And I'm Alec. Um, and we are so very honored and excited to uh, share with you all the launch of the Vincent J. Rosevic Register of Slaves in Fairfield, Connecticut. So the purpose of this project has always been multifaceted. Dr. Roosevelt's goal was to fill in the blanks of history that writers had left out. First and foremost, he wanted to create a database that would allow for the descendants of Fairfield slaves to explore their heritage. This meant collecting as many records as possible of the town's resident slaves and organizing them as people, not property. He hoped that as a result of this reorganization, we would be able to create real and meaningful family trees. I am happy to say that we have reconstructed quite a few families in this database. But Dr. Roosevelt always understood the implications of this project. The data that we have amassed tells the story of a town that relied much more heavily on slavery than was previously thought. This register has collected records of hundreds of slaves which had previously been unrecognized by history. And so we wanted to start by taking you through a brief history of the project. Um, the image on the left is the title page of a talk called Slavery in Fairfield at the End of the Colonial Period. Um, and this talk was given to the Fairfield Historical Society by Dr. Rosevic in 1992. Um, and this was the original presentation that kick-started this project. Um, uh, focused specifically on the time period of 1760 to 1790 here in Fairfield um, in what Dr. Rosevic called, quote, principally a selective but somewhat detailed examination of three different categories of historical sources to show that some of the different kinds of information which these sources can provide about slaves and slavery here in Fairfield. Um, those sources were census data, probate data, and general knowledge about the uh, social structure of Connecticut. Some 27 years later, um, excuse me, this presentation has been brought to this present day research form. Um, over time, further research into church records, uh, property records, newspaper advertisements, military records, and other types of archives surmounted into the creation of a catalog of 1,100 entries um, that we were able to condense into um, this data, <laughs> um, some of the data points you see in front of you. Um, our final estimate is that there are 897 slaves in our database and uh, 392 households. And at this point, it's important to just clarify some of the terms we'll be using. Um, to describe somebody who was enslaved in Fairfield at that, uh, at, during this time period, we'll use the word the slaves or individuals. And the slave owners, we will call households throughout the rest of the project. Um, the database also features 947 slave to household relationships. And essentially what that is, is um, when we were able to find an indication that that slave was owned by a particular person or group of persons who lived in Fairfield. Um, and it also accounts for if a slave moved between households at various points throughout their own life. Um, some other important uh, facts and figures, I guess, are that there are 472 males and 403 females in our database, in addition to like 27 uh, entries that we weren't able to find information based off of what we had, what their gender was, um, which was interesting for Alec and I to like consider because it was pretty 50-50 um, and something that 
was very important to us throughout the project is the misconceptions about Northern slavery uh, as opposed to Southern slavery. What people tend to think about in slavery in general is what they think about for the South. And they tend to write off the fact that there was slavery in the North. And a part of the research that Alec and I were doing was figuring out those uh, tenements that slavery was built upon in the North as well. Um, one of which we found, interestingly enough, was that they had a rather equal ratio of male to female slaves where in the South it tended to be more male oriented. Um, and when we get into the database a bit later, these circles are interesting and everything, but you'll be able to see uh, the data play out in real time um, in our database as well. So a little bit of history about Fairfield and slavery in Fairfield. Fairfield's history of slavery is nearly as long as Fairfield's history itself. It was founded in 1639 and originally stretched from Reading at its northernmost, the Saugatuck River at its west, and Black Rock at its east. Over the next few centuries, Fairfield broke into a number of other towns, namely Reading, Westport, and Weston. And as you can see, this is a map that I personally altered so that you could see the different boundaries. And at the top you have Redding, that orange shape that breaks off from Fairfield in 1767. Then lower down you have Northfield, which turns into Weston and Easton, and that breaks off from Fairfield in 1787. And then everything lower than that with the green lines around it is what we have been consider considering Fairfield from uh, 1639 to 1848, which is Fairfield's founding to the ending of slavery in Connecticut. This also includes Westport. Westport didn't break off until essentially all of the slaves in Fairfield had been freed. Um, so slavery in Fairfield really gets its start uh, right after King Philip's War, uh, which was fought between European settlers and an alliance of American Indians. Fairfield's first slaves were likely prisoners of war and their families. Throughout the database, uh, there are scattered entries of Native American slaves, men, women, and children, uh, appearing close to the end of this conflict in 1770, in 1678, excuse me. Um, then slavery hits its peak in the mid 1700s. Uh, most of the records in this database come from between 1730 and 1780, uh, and this cluster of records made it originally difficult to figure out the number and uh, demographics of the slaves in Fairfield because the first U.S. Census wasn't until 1790, and it was flawed at best. Um, then later on in 1779, there was a petition written uh, by two of Fairfield slaves named Prince and Prime, uh, and they were petitioning for the end to slavery in Connecticut. There was no action on this until 1784 uh, when Connecticut passed a gradual emancipation law. What this did was it um, allowed for female slaves who were born after 1784 to be freed when they turned 21, and male slaves to be freed when they turned 25. However, there were some other stipulations. Slaves who were ill could not be freed because they would then become a burden on the town. And slaves over the age of 45 were not allowed to be freed because they were considered too old to work. And likewise, a burden on society. Then, by about 1820, <laughs> most of Fairfield's slaves were free, though a few white slave owners held on to their human property. And in 1848, Connecticut finally passed complete emancipation. Slavery in Connecticut was done. So just a little bit about our resources. We really can't <laughs> talk about all of this without it. Um, we went into a lot of very, very different resources, but the most important ones were probate records, um, church records from a number of local parishes, and uh, Donald Lyons Jacobus, a genealogist from Connecticut, his book, History and Genealogy of the Families of Old Fairfield. So I want to talk about the probate records first. Um, so for those of you who don't know, probate is generally um, speaking, three different types of documents, wills, inventories of estates, and distributions of those estates to the heirs of a person who is deceased. And in these documents that we were looking through, slaves would not be listed as people, but as the property being transferred from one slave owner to another. And 
so what we were doing is basically going through each of these sources and pulling out pieces of property and listing them as people. Um, now, each of these people typically has a certain value ascribed to them, and some descriptors, including Negro girl, Negro wench, stuff like that. And so we would do our best to try and figure out how these people were connected, and so on. Um, church records were equally as important. Um, so the parishes of Fairfield, Greens Farm, Stratfield, Greenfield Hill, and a few others uh, kept records of residents' births, deaths, baptisms, and marriages. In many cases, the individual who made note of these events would explicitly say that the subject of the writing was a slave owned by a specific person in Fairfield. Slaves, like other people in Fairfield, were allowed to be married and even baptized. However, these records can be muddled in naming practices of the time. For this reason, it's often difficult to determine whether certain individuals are free or enslaved, because slaves and a lot of uh, recently freed slaves did not have last names. Um, and then lastly, Donald Lines Jacobus, this genealogist that I just mentioned, um, his book, which was published in the earlier half of the, of the 20th century, um, History and Genealogy of the Families of Old Fairfield, yes, we have a physical copy right here, um, compiled extensive genealogical trees of many of the prominent families of Fairfield. This book was invaluable to us as a research team as we tried to identify who specific slave owners were. And as we were going through this, we, of course, came across the issue that this book only listed white uh, residents of Fairfield for the most part. So the book generally excludes non-white residents except for a few in notes sections. And women are listed in this book only as the wives and daughters of an individual entry. Uh, so this book provides a wealth of information for us as we were trying to figure out who these people were, but it didn't tell the whole story. Uh, this next slide just shows some images of the primary source documents we used, uh, plus the cover of Jacobus's book. Um, but the next thing that we wanted to do was talk about our methodologies and what we were specifically looking for in those sources that Alec just was talking about. Um, as Alec mentioned, we were using a variety of different primary sources um, to aid in our research. These documents could be quite overwhelming on first glance. like. Those are kind of really hard to read. Um, and it became clear to us once we knew what we were looking for, um, and we wanted to share some of those things with you today. Um, some of the things that we would be looking for in our uh, research of primary sources um, included uh, the name of the slave, if applicable, the slave's household, um, their value, any birth, death, baptism, marriage information, if it came from a church record, um, and then citations for where this information was found, by far the most important thing we were looking for. Um, it was also important for us to note any records of movement of the slaves, um, any interesting notes in the distribution, um, and those would all go in like a notes section. Um, and once completed a record, it would look something like this. So the picture um, on the screen you see right now is the uh, inventory of Abraham Morehouse in 1761. And as you look at the screen where the arrow is pointing, you can see that it's pointing at an entry called Negro Girl named Dinah. Uh, 30 pounds, but she's not the only slave listed in the inventory. If you look on the line above, uh, Negro Wench, 20 pounds. Next to her, <laughs> Negro Girl Jenny, 28 pounds, maybe? Something like that. So, 28. Uh, Negro Girl called Nancy, and Negro Boy called Jack. Jack. Um, so that group of five were the slave slaves of Abraham Morehouse that he listed in his inventory. This was the information that we would compile for Dinah, um, including any ba the baptism record we have from the Fairfield Congregational Church. Um, in the will of Abraham Morehouse, which is not pictured here, it states that he bequeaths, which means give, um, Dinah to his daughter Rebecca, and then the citations. And then what this all translates into is the following... Uh, entry. So this is our database, um, and this is what Dinah's entry looks like. The catalog number is something that Alec and I used uh, to kind of keep track of our own records. Um, Dinah was owned by three different people. She has three different catalog numbers to make sure that we had all of that information uh, when we were condensing it into this one 
database. Uh, she's a female, and then all of those same notes, plus a couple of more from the other entries, are listed there, as well as the story of Dinah, which we'll talk about a bit later. And then this part down here is the really interesting part about our database, I would argue. Um, her husband, her children, and her house, uh, the households of which she was a part of are all able to be linked to Dinah's one entry in our database. And then if you're interested in learning more about those people, they link directly to each other. So they're all looped into each other and you can explore families um, as easy as the click of the mouse, which I think is pretty cool. Um, let's see, where is, yeah, cool. <laughs> Awesome. And so that was one half of our, our methodology, um, data collection and how it came into the catalog. The other half was the households. As Alec already mentioned, um, Donald Zanjacobus did a lot of this work for us. So it was mostly just finding the citations in his sources um, and making sure we were connecting the right people to the right slaves. Um, in the example of Abraham Morehouse, to continue Dinah's little story. Um, we knew it had to be an Abraham Morehouse who died in 1761. That first red circle up at the top is our first context clue in um, Abraham Morehouse's entry, and this is a screenshot of Jacobus. I forgot to mention that. Um, the second context clue we really had was that he bequeathed Dinah to his daughter, Rebecca, um, who married uh, Matthew Jennings, which you can see in the second circle is listed also right there. Um, so with that information, we were able to conclude that this was the right uh, Abraham Morehouse, and we came up with our own little code uh, to identify that this is Jacobus book two, page 667, line number nine, so we could find very specifically where it was in um, Donald Lange Jacobus's book. The catalog number, as I just mentioned, is us cross-referencing, making sure that all of the information got into the database um, and all of the proper slaves were attributed to the proper households. And then, like with Dinah, this is what that entry looks like. Um, like I said, Donald Lange Jacobus did a lot of the work for us. So we direct you to book two, page 667, line nine, um, to get more information. And it also links all of the slaves just like it did in the, uh, in the slave side of the database. Um, and this might seem confusing and overwhelming, but we have laptops that so you're more than welcome to explore during our reception at the end, so you guys can explore through the database as well. Um, cool. <laughs> that being said, uh, this is our database. Um, it lives at digitalhumanities.fairfield.edu slash slavery. Um, and this is the first page when you enter into our database. Um, the image in the background is a woman named Nancy Tony, who is actually a slave that we found in uh, Fairfield. And this is a portrait of her, which I think is pretty interesting. It lives in a school in Wilton, I believe. Windsor. Windsor. <laughs> I always get that wrong. Um, and there are, very, there are uh, several ways in which you can explore our database. The first, as I mentioned, was the slave side of thing. If you know the name of a slave you're looking for, you can search them in the search bar or just go through our pages. Um, 892, it might be easier to use a search bar. Um, and then the same thing with the households. If it's a woman who we know who they married, um, we'll include their former name as well in case the slave was listed under that information in the primary source you may be looking at or someone in the future may be looking at. Um, the other way, if you just want to explore, um, is to go to our graph. This is a really awesome tool that's not loading. Ah, there it is, okay. Um, this is a really awesome tool um, that Robert Hoyt in the library helped us to create. Um, and it is family mapping, essentially, of all of the families and the um, slaves that we had. So if I scroll out, scroll out, um, you will see all uh, 892 individuals. You can move throughout the database. Um, and if you zoom in, you can also see different family units. I picked a scary one. <laughs> there we go, that one looks nice. So the blue lines are children attached to um, parents and the red lines are individuals who are married to each other. Um, and the same thing applies if you're interested in learning a bit more about Edward, you can click on it and get directly to his information. Um, so that's a little bit about our database. Um, and we, the next thing we wanted to do was share a couple of the stories, because there are so many. Um, just share a couple of the stories with you all um, of some important particular stories. But I'll let Alex start with that one. So the slave that we were just looking at, Dinah, is a particularly interesting entry in this database. Um, because she is completely unique to this particular group. Um, so, 
Dinah was baptized at around the age of five on January 15th in Fairfield, uh, January 15th, 1753, <laughs> at this time, and uh, for the next eight years, Dinah was a slave to Abraham Morehouse. When Morehouse died, she was bequeathed to uh, his daughter, Rebecca Jennings, and valued at 30 pounds. Dinah reappears over 50 years later in the estate of Rebecca Jennings. On April 2nd, 1812, Dinah was emancipated at the age of 64. According to Rebecca Jennings, she was influenced by the strong desire of Dinah and in consideration of her long and faithful services and of the sum of one dollar by her time in hand paid but, um, to emancipate Dinah. But these circumstances are very, very strange. Dinah was nearly 20 years older than the maximum age for emancipation. By law, slaves older than 45 could not be emancipated because they would become a burden on the town. So with this in mind, it's likely that Dinah had somehow proven that she would be able to support herself or that someone else would be supporting her. But it gets even stranger. Um, when Rebecca Jennings wrote her will, uh, she had no direct heirs. All of them had either died or had moved away. Dinah and her descendants were all that was left. Dinah had four living children and two grandchildren. What Jennings did was completely unprecedented in this database. Dinah, her children Pompey, Nancy, Peg, and Amos were each given one-sixth of, Je of Jennings' entire estate. The children of her daughter Priscilla and Priscilla, named Edwin and Priscilla, were each given a twelfth of the estate. One of the possible reasons for this was the relationship between Dinah and Rebecca. Slave and owner had lived with each other their entire lives. Dinah was born when Rebecca Jennings was just twelve. The two grew up together. So perhaps there was a friendship between the two, in some strange sense of the word. The next story that we wanted to share was one of our favorites, uh, the story of Tim and Lil. Um, unlike most of Fairfield slaves, there is a long paper trail regarding Tim's history. Um, we have Tim's baptismal records. We have um, his original owner. Um, and in 1772, that original owner, William Bennett, died, um, and he bequeathed Tim to his wife, Abigail, um, where Tim is listed as a boy. So we know that this is the beginning of the story because he's listed as a boy. Um, he was then given to the son of William and Abigail, Captain Joseph Bennett. Um, and in February of 1791, Tim married another slave named Lil, um, who was a slave of Ashael Disbrow um, in the very same church that Tim was baptized in 26 years earlier. Um, together, Tim and Lil had five children, Nancy, William Ward, uh, Iyer, and twins Amos and Almond. Um, but for nearly three years, the family lived separated from each other because they were owned by two different families. Um, however, three years in into their marriage. Um, Lil and William Ward were sold into uh, the Bennett household from the Disbrow household. And in 1799, Tim and Lil were emancipated um, and they left Fairfield for Delhi, New York. Um, and this is where a lot of their information comes from. Um, in 1999, a historian named Diane Sassone uh, wrote an article about Tim and Lil Bennett, um, as they were known in Delhi, New York, called Journeys of Freedom. And a long, long history of the Bennetts in Delhi, New York, were able to be um, indicated through that. Um, they had a grocer in their family. They had somebody who made the local cemetery in their family. Um, but from their move to Delhi, this, all of this information was able to come about. We think that they're a particularly interesting story in our case because while we know a lot about what happened after they left Fairfield, our research also was able to find Tim's parents, uh, Nungiven and Harry. Nungiven is what we call people who we don't have enough information to give them a name in the database. But through our research, we were able to find that that was the connection of Tim. So we were able to trace, as opposed to what Sison did in 1999, trace the family forward. We were able to trace the family back one more generation, which we thought was pretty cool. Um, let's go to the next one. So the another slave that I want to talk about is Jack Rowland. So Jack, his name was not originally Roland. Roland was some mysterious owner who owned him prior to our records. Um, and at some point, Roland, or Roland either sold or bequeathed Jack to Hezekiah um, Sanford. No, yeah. yes, sorry, <laughs> Hezekiah Sanford. 
And we often think about these people as just being slaves. That's how we identify them, that this was a slave. But in this case, Jack was a veteran. And unlike many of the slaves in this database, Jack actually fought for the side of the Americans in the Revolutionary War. According to the work of Donald Lyons Jacobus in his book, History and Genealogy of the Families of Old Fairfield, Jack enlisted on January 20th, 1777 in Captain Ezekiel Sanford's company. Unlike many slaves at this time, Jack was fighting for the American cause. Many of the slaves that we have documented fought for the British because there was this thing called a General Birch's Certificate, which would free slaves who fought for the British Army. However, Ezekiel Sanford, who Jack was serving under, was the brother of Hezekiah Sanford, Jack's owner. Ezekiel clearly wanted to distance himself from Jack. In fact, Ezekiel made Jack serve with the surname Roland, a name which he hadn't used in years. Incredibly, Jack wintered at Valley Forge, meaning that he crossed paths with General George Washington. By the spring of, by the spring of 1778, Jack was ill and homesick. He asked to be sent back to Fairfield, but under the conditions that he would work as a slave to Hezekiah Sanford for another three years. This was an enormous sacrifice on Jack's part, as Connecticut law dictated that his service to the militia itself would emancipate him. Sanford agreed to the terms and reclaimed Jack as his slave, and additionally paid for someone to take his place in the military. After being given his freedom at the age of 28, Jack took the name Freeman. He stayed in Fairfield, but what he did to stay afloat is still unknown. And the final story that we wanted to share uh, today was an example of a slave that we found when we just weren't looking for them. Um, last semester, I was writing a paper about uh, the history of Fairfield, and I was using a source entitled um, The Slaves of Central Connecticut. And I was just using it as a background research for a paper that I was writing when I came across uh, some information about a woman named Time, who was born in 1773 in Newtown, but in 1804. 1804 was sold to former slave Titus Bradley for $50. Uh, Titus was a former slave here in Fairfield, and he was formally emancipated by his owner Hezekiah Bradley in 1802. Uh, freed slaves purchasing uh, loved ones was a very common practice, so this was just what we thought another example. When I looked into the database, I didn't see them. We were able to add them in there. But according to the historian Daniel Cruson, who wrote the book, uh, their story is a little bit different than some of the other ones we were expecting. Uh, this purchase uh, stated that time was sold, quote, for and during her natural life of the said Negro girl. Um, and given the wording of this document, as we supposed across the other documents that we were looking at, um, this suggested that she was still a slave in the traditional sense when uh, Titus Bradley purchased her. However, time and Titus were married. So I just lost my place. So this is a supposition, but... What, we're, what we were able to deduce from this one little entry was that Ti Titus purchased his wife and she was remained uh, enslaved because he couldn't emancipate her as a result of their being married and he be him being a uh, freed slave, which is a very interesting circumstance in our database. Um, and the reason why, again, we wanted to share this story was I was doing research on something completely different and we found a new slave for our database, which kind of goes to say that this work can never truly be done because we don't know what types of data is still out there that we haven't yet discovered. Um, and we're going to move on to what's next. And simply put, what next is what's next is anything. Um, this project can still be expanded upon. There are certainly probate records we didn't get to look through yet. Um, and like I said, other types of sources we just simply haven't cross paths with yet. Um, similar projects like this one can be completed by other historians in other towns. Fairfield's own uh, database can continue to be expanded upon. And there are so many other ways that we didn't look at our data. Um, what jobs did these slaves have in these households? Um, where did they live within the town lines? There's so many questions even within our database that Alec and I just simply haven't had the chance to answer yet, um, which we think is really cool because the project is able to continue and grow beyond the two of us. Um, and we're very excited to have Brendan McCarthy, who is a rising senior here at Fairfield um, and a fellow American Studies major, continuing on the project next year um, and continuing in Dr. Rosevic's legacy. Um, as for what you all can do um, with our database, it will permanently live here at the university at digitalhumanities.fairfield.edu slash slavery. Um, 
which is very exciting. Um, and students, faculty, staff, anybody who is on our web library website is able to use our database to continue in their own research or interest in the project, which I think is really exciting. Um, in addition to that, we will be gifting a copy to uh, Dr. Rose at the Fairfield Museum History Center so that people within the town can also look through the genealogical work that we have um, and maybe find information about their own family or somebody who lived in the house that they lived in, um, which is also very, uh, very awesome. And we're very looking forward to it. Um, just some final notes from Alec and I. It has been a really, really great honor to be able to work along this project. We both remember why we started this project. We were so interested in learning a bit more about Fairfield. Um, and when Dr. Fien uh, Dr. Rosevic passed away um, last, last April, it was without a doubt we were going to continue this project in his memory. Um, and so we're very excited that you all came out uh, with us today to see our database and to support us in all of that. And we just wanted to give a couple of very important thank yous. First to the ladies at the probate court who <laughs> were always so um, excited to see us and hear. <laughs> yes, thank you. And let us in their back room while we just were shuttered in there with a bunch of books <laughs> looking at things that people hadn't looked at in years. Thank you very much. And Yes. Uh, the second is to Dr. Rose in the Fairfield Museum and History Center. Um, a lot of what we have contextually that we lost. Dr. Rosevic came from all of you, and we're very appreciative of all of that help. <laughs> I mentioned him already, but Robert Hoyt, who works here in the library, Alec and I have no idea how any <laughs> computer things work, and without Robert Hoyt, this wouldn't have been, this would have been possible. Um, so thank you for always helping us with this and answering my very late night emails with a meeting the very next morning. Um, very, very appreciative of that. And finally, to our mentor, Dr. Ruffini, who uh, took on the project and us um, after Dr. Rosevic's passing last year. Um, we very much appreciate your guidance, your support, um, and your help throughout the last year. And we're very, very appreciative of all that you have done for us. And thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And finally, to Alexa Malati, who helped us uh, organize this event today and helped us order all this wonderful food and print these wonderful brochures. Thank you so much for all of your help. Do you have anything you want to say? Do you want to say anything? Uh, so thank you very much. And Dr. Feeney's going to say something final. <laughs> Well, I've already made up a fictional story about how this project came to be housed in the provost's office. Now we have somebody from the provost's office here to set us straight. <laughs> Actually, with, with some brief words, Dr. Barishko, if you would, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm struck by the fact that this, to me, is what a Fairfield education looks like. It is extraordinary what these two young people, Alec and Olivia, have done under the guidance of Professor Ruffini. Could we just give them one more shout out? It is amazing. <laughs> Their work will be featured tomorrow at the Innovation Research, Innovative Research Symposium and also at the reception afterward. So please do come by and visit them yet again and learn more about their projects. The more that we get to engage with them, the more we get to learn, the more exciting it is. I'm really honored to be here today to celebrate the research of both Olivia and Alec with the support of their faculty mentor, Professor Giovanni Ruffini, which began and continued the work of that of my friend and colleague, the late Professor Vin Rosevac. For those of you in the room who knew Vin, you may likely recall how he would often recommend that faculty investigate IPEDS data that captures key points of information about gender and racial diversity, hiring at universities and colleges across the US, budgetary numbers, and a whole range of other sources of data. He wanted his fellow faculty members to gather evidence through data to build their arguments around compensation and salary in particular. I recall sitting in those general faculty meetings, and these are the meetings for students where all of the faculty at Fairfield come together and vote on particular issues and uh, policies, et cetera. And I remember when I first started at Fairfield, almost 20 years ago now, and I sat there listening to Vin talk about iPeds data. 
and I honestly did not know what in the world he was talking about. And I thought then, when I learned that he was a professor of the class classics, I thought, wow, this is, this is interesting. I would have expected this from a professor of mathematics or maybe economics, but it was coming from Vin. And what he was doing was inviting us into the ways that we can gather evidence, make arguments, and assert our claims based upon them. He was making a bigger case, in short. He was inviting faculty to learn the facts on their own about the university where they worked and taught our students. He was inviting us to understand that knowing your immediate context is critical to understanding and shaping your reality. This research project to create a register of slaves in Fairfield, Connecticut, manifests the impulse of Vin's life and work. Olivia and Alec have gone deep into archival records to gather information about Native and African American slaves here in this town where we live and where we work. This work will enable descendants from slaves to learn about their ancestors in ways that will enable them to understand their life stories. Such work contributes to that of others such as Sharon Morgan and from other people around the country who have developed archival data and done so so that descendants of slaves in the United States can investigate their genealogies. This effort today that we've learned about connects to others that started under the Works Project Administration or the WPA in the 1930s when journalists and writers were paid by the government to travel throughout the South and gather the stories of the last generation of living slaves. This archive, now at the Library of Congress called Remembering Slavery and popularized by the HBO documentary, offers a groundwork for the Fairfield Project, which belongs to a rich and essential one in the United States. How many of you know about the Remembering Slavery Project? A few of you? How many of you have used it in your classes? Yeah. I know that Betsy Bowen uses it also, and she's not here today. It is an extraordinary resource if you are not familiar with it. Identifying, archiving, and remembering slaves brings their stories to light and enacts the process of decolonization through humanizing those who have been dehumanized. Having access to those pieces of information about these lived human experiences enables Native and African American peoples to know about their life stories. It also holds accountable those who have owned slaves and engaged in the process of colonization. We also need to hold that part of the story, which played out here in Fairfield, Connecticut, and was central to building the town in which we live and or work. A critical part of this project is its digital presence that will make it widely accessible. The Digital Humanities Project of the Humanities Institute and the College of Arts and Sciences has made this possible. Yesterday, along with many of you, I'm sure, I had the opportunity to see the presentations by the Humanities Institute student fellows. And I was particularly struck by two of those presentations that I thought echoed the work of both Olivia and Alec. One project examined the murals in Connecticut post offices that were painted as part of the Works Project Administration in the 1930s. And the other was about folklore in the Gambia. These may seem a bit disparate, so hear me out. Alec and Olivia engaged in deep archival research to unearth a critical part of Fairfield's local history, gathering information about slaves, many of whom were forced to come to the United States from the African continent, where the Gambia is. Ultimately, their project will enable descendants of these peoples to know their story, a critical element of making sense of our realities that expand well beyond the boundaries of Fairfield, Connecticut to the world. Such research projects carried out by Fairfield students under faculty mentorship are the hallmark of a Fairfield education. We support our students in taking their interests and pursuing them beyond the classroom or the laboratory, whether it's deep into the bowels of a museum's basement or across the Atlantic to the Gambia. Professor Rosevac understood the centrality of this process that makes a Fairfield liberal arts education so unique. This afternoon, we celebrate his memory as it lives on through this project, which will contribute to our collective understanding of the world in which we live and it will empower us to make it a better place. We do, in the provost office, have support to continue this work. 
And we are committed to supporting the student who has already been identified, and we will continue to support this work, and we look forward to doing so. In the meantime, please join me in congratulating Olivia and Alec, whose exploration of the past will help carry us into a better future. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I know we have three laptops set up with a database for all of you to explore yourself in real time now. But before we do that, if there are any questions for Olivia and Alec, I know that this wouldn't be complete if we didn't put them on the spot and make them squirm a little bit about the work they've done. So please, if any of you do have any questions, I know I, I have several myself. So if, if any of you would like to ask. So I was wondering if there was going to be the opportunity for others besides those who can access Fairfield's library site to interface with this information. Okay. Um, yeah, so that is something that we're definitely going to be considering as we move forward from today. Um, I think that the two most important places for us to deliver the site to um, before today was to the university and to the historical society. Um, and so then moving forward, um, I think that one of uh, both of our goals is to figure out other places that we can house it. Um, I was going through emails just last night, um, like from the last two and a half years attached to this project to see anything else I could pull out. Um, and I found a uh, old link that Dr. Rosevic had sent us about um, a project that's local to Connecticut that puts down stones or like memorials of where slavery used to occur in Connecticut. So that's something that I mean, I'm gonna look into in the future. Um, but there has to be more places like that that we can also explore, including places to put the database itself. I'd be glad to share some ideas for that. Thank you, Dr. Rose. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can you tell me, um, the genealogy books that you um, have referenced online, are they online as well? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes and no. <laughs> Um, for about a year, I have been using online copies and searching via a search bar through that. Um, but then in the last couple of months, for some reason, it has become nearly unavailable. And so only there are two of the volumes of this book on Ancestry.com. It's not as easily accessible as the original copy that I was using, um, but it is still pretty easy to look through it and if you actually type in the page number um, to the keyword section which is cited on all of these entries of households you can just go straight to the household and read as much as you feel you know inclined to <laughs> um, but yeah it, it's kind of difficult to navigate now I was just These, going to make that suggestion yeah. that you, mm -hmm. for anyone following your work mm -hmm. uh, that they should hyperlink those page numbers because many people are not don't yeah. have access to libraries where they can exactly these three copies do live here at the Fairfield University Library however if anybody on campus wants to see them yeah. great <laughs> first of all thank you so much for doing this work and presenting it to us um, I was reading just this morning about uh, Georgetown students who are really engaged in activism around rep reparations mm -hmm. um, based on what they've learned about the local circumstances, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to put you on the spot necessarily about <laughs> reparations, although I'm interested to hear. Um, but I do want to know, um, Based on being so deep and engaged in this local work, um, what has really changed for you personally about how you think about this critical part of our history and this issue? Um, I mean, really everything. But <laughs> on a smaller scale, now when I am walking around my own town of Huntington, New York, and in Fairfield, Connecticut, I'm always looking at this place in terms of history. I'm thinking when I walk down Post Road that 
I'm not just, I'm not the only one to have done this, that some of the people in our database probably did this as well. And as I'm thinking about my own life walking down that road, they were thinking about their own lives. And it's really just humanized all of these records for me. You know, they're not, they're not just names and numbers and values, they're real people with real stories. Yeah, and I think to echo some of that, um, something that I've definitely noticed over like the last two and a half years of working on this is household, like the household names that bear, like kind of like what Georgetown is doing, the household names in the town of Fairfield that bear marks of slavery in them. Um, it's something like in our original, like when there were three of us on the project, one of our big things um, with the other student re researcher was seeing how many street names in Fairfield are named after households yeah. in our database, yeah. which we also have information of. And so when we're driving through town and we like recognize a street name or recognize a street name, um, Jennings Beach, Penfield yeah, Pavilion, um, Barlow Road, just some of the names that you can see in our database are just yeah. all over and it's very cognizant. Even um, when uh, we still had the Sturgis Barn on, on campus before it got tore down, we definitely did our research into who that Sturgis was. Um, it wasn't one of us. Don't worry, you would have heard about it by now. <laughs> uh, no relation to any of our people, to our knowledge. Um, but it's something that I've definitely been more cognizant of. Yes? When you were alluding to the Jacobus book, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the identifier after a number of these slaves mm -hmm. as uh, Negro. Mm -hmm. Were there other than Negro slaves? Were there Native American slaves, for example? Yeah. And if so, how are they identified? So it's actually pretty interesting. Negro is only one of the terms that is used to describe some of these slaves. There are also slaves that are described as mulatto, which is, as far as I know, only partially Negro, just using the vocabulary of this particular topic. And then there are a few, quote, Indian slaves. Um, for the large majority, it is Negro and Mulatto, um, and yeah, and sometimes yes, sometimes just servant, my slave. Oftentimes they didn't really just they, they didn't care enough about the person to actually describe them in any way. So, uh, one of the interesting things about that, though, on the flip side of that, is when they were interested in describing them, it was in runaway slave ads. Something that Alec didn't really touch upon very uh, generally, but we're happy to explain uh, during the reception, or if you're just generally curious, um, is when we had runaway slave ads, they would describe that individual to the T. Like, liked to play the flute in one particular instance. Like, very, very specific. And so those are very interesting uh, juxtapositions in the data um, that I think is also important to recognize. Uh, Dr. Ruggie. Uh, I just, this brings up a really interesting point for me, the connection. The Runaway Slave Ed was a, was a project of some Wesleyan students mm -hmm. um, like a half dozen years ago. Mm -hmm. I can't, I couldn't most recently find the website mm -hmm. that they supposedly uh, put up for perpetuity. But if you have a list of those, most importantly, if you actually have JPEGs of those, if you made photos of them, mm -hmm. um, that might be a very interesting ancillary uh, database mm -hmm. that you can use. And if there are explorations like this going around the states. Yes. And at a certain point, we need to build a highway to all of them. Yes, um, I, I know that Cornell University has a site called Freedom on the Move, which yeah. has cataloged something like 1,200 different runaway slave ads from all across the country. Yeah. Um, it's free to use. You just need to create a username and password, which I'll probably forget eventually. <laughs> um, but it's really fascinating. Well, um, yeah, and you might be able to contribute information yes. to those, as well as just having it for yourself, you know, yes, absolutely. identified as new business. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So we can take one more question and then we can start the reception. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could you explain to us the, the cost placed on the slaves? Was that what the owner paid for the slave or this person was simply valued at this amount? Yeah. So 
on one of my earlier slides, you might have seen the value average. Um, that was from probate records um, with just like Dinah on that slide where I was explaining the methodology. Um, it said she was 30 pounds. Those are values as if any, uh, like the chairs in the house had simu like similar values appraised to them. The land had similar values appraised to them. Um, so those are the values uh, supposed of that person or of that item, if it was like their bedding or whatever. Um, supposed by the executors of the um, inventory will and distribution. So those weren't actually payments unless we had indication that they were like deeds of sale, but for a uh, majority of them, the values are the values assigned in the probate records. And values change depending on the age of the slave, the gender of the slave, and their ability. So we have one record of a slave who is blind and she's not gonna be as valuable to a slave owner as a young man would be. Awesome. Um, we're happy to continue to take questions, but we wanted you all to enjoy the reception that was sponsored by the College of Arts and Sciences as well. Um, <laughs> thank you again so much for coming, and we really appreciate it.